All right, so welcome back. We've all had a little bit of a break. Uh, before I get into, I go over my quick recap. Uh, you've hopefully all seen the announcements that we're going to delay the due date of the next problem set uh, until Tuesday. Um, that's in part because some of the material that appears on it is what we're going to talk about in today's lecture. So I want to make sure you've at least seen a lecture on all the, the topics uh, before you try to do some of the problems on it. Um, in truth, you could probably, based on things I talked about in the previous lecture, you could probably deduce a lot of what you need to do, but still it's good to go over it um, a little bit more methodically. Um, <clears throat> and uh, anything else I want to say? Yeah, so then the next problem set will be posted a week from, is that right? Yeah, I think it'll be posted a week from today. All right, um, so let me just get back to what we were talking about last time. So I began introducing uh, some <clears throat> geometric concepts and some quantities that we use to describe matter. We've done a lot of things so far that's appropriate for describing kind of the kinematics of particles. Uh, but that's rather restrictive. Okay, we want to talk about a broader class of things than that. And I began by introducing something which is, again, fairly simple, but it's uh, a, a, a useful tool for beginning to uh, think about how we are going to mathematically categorize certain important types of matter. Pardon me while I put some of my notes away. Uh, <clears throat> also, pardon me, I'm recovering from a, I caught a terrible cold over the long weekend, and I'm coughing incessantly, so. I will be occasionally sucking on a cough drop. All right, so I introduced this quantity called the number four vector. And that is given by, imagine you have sort of, an, it, it's, it's best thinking about this in the context of something like dust. So you have some kind of non-interacting uh, little agglomeration of tiny particles. Um, and in the rest frame of an element of this dust, so imagine you go into the, well, I'm going to define the rest frame of that element by saying, you know, imagine you've got a cubic nanometer of it or something like that. And you go into the frame where everything in that cubic nanometer is, on average, at rest. We'll call n sub 0 the rest density. OK, so I forgot to write that down. So that's the rest density, the rest, pardon me, number density. So I go into that rest frame. That tells me how many little dust particles there are per cubic volume, or per element of volume. Multiply that by the four vector that, excuse me, the four velocity describing that element. And we're going to call that capital N. So that's a vector that describes its, its, its components describe the number density in some other frame of reference, in any frame of reference, um, and the flux, telling me about how those dust particles flow from one element to another. So we spent a little bit of time talking about how to define volume elements in a covariant fashion. I'm not going to go through that, but part of the punchline of doing that is that uh, we're going to define a sort of a, what I call a covariant formulation of conservation of number is it's going to be the space-time divergence of that vector is equal to zero. Okay, that holds, this equation holds in all frames of reference. If I choose a particular frame of reference, in other words, I define a particular time, I define a particular set of spatial coordinates, I can then break this up and say that this is equivalent to saying that the time derivative of the t component of that plus the spatial divergence of the spatial comments of that, they sum to zero. I can also take this thing and integrate over a, oops, would help to have an element defined here. I integrate this over a four-dimensional volume, and by my conservation law, I must get zero when I do that. Again, having chosen a particular frame, defined what time means, defined what space means, I can then split this out into an, uh, a statement that the uh, time derivative of the, the, the volume integral of the time component of this thing is balanced by the flux of the number across the boundaries of a particular three volume. Okay? Now, I remind you this notation, this sort of delta V3 means the boundaries of the V3 that's used under this integral. Okay, so we talked a little bit about a few other uh, four vectors that are used. In particular, I introduced some stuff uh, that we use in electricity and magnetism, but I want to switch gears. Okay, in particular, I want to introduce and discuss in some detail one of the most important tensors we are going to use all term. So <clears throat> I motivated this by saying, imagine you know, I have a cloud of dust, and I won't recreate one because I'm <laughs> getting over a cold and I, want, I don't want to breathe chalk dust. 
Um, so imagine I make a little cloud of these things here. Um, so far, we've characterized this thing by just counting the number of dust particles that are in there. But that's not all there is to it, right? That dust has other properties. And so the next thing which I would like to do is let's consider the energy and the momentum of every particle of dust in that cloud. OK, so let's just imagine. Let's, again, we're going to start with something simple, and then we'll kind of uh, walk up from there to a more uh, generic situation. Let's imagine that my cloud consists of particles that are all identicals, and each dust particle has the same rest mass. So suppose this guy has a rest mass m. <clears throat> so one of the things which I might want to do is, in addition to characterizing this dust by saying that the number density, <clears throat> me, in addition to saying that the number density in a particular frame is n or n0, let's go into the rest frame of this thing. I might be interested in knowing about the rest energy density. So I'm going to denote the rest energy density by rho sub 0. Each particle has a rest energy of m. Remember, c is equal to 1. So mc squared, if you want to uh, if you want to hold to the formula that we've all known and loved since we were babies. So that's the rest energy. And then how many, if I want to get the rest energy density, I count up the number in each volume or the number per unit volume. So that's m times n0. So that's the rest energy density of this thing. Great. Let's now ask, OK, so that's what it looks like in the rest frame of this, of this uh, dust element. <clears throat> Let's imagine that I now bop into a frame that is moving with some speed relative to this rest frame. In this frame, the energy density, I'm not going to say rest energy density because I'm no longer in the rest frame, but the energy density in this frame which I will denote by rho without the subscript 0, it's going to be the energy of each particle. So that's gamma times m. And the volume is going to be length. It's going to be a little bit larger. Sorry, the volume is smaller, right? So uh, because of a length contraction, and so this guy actually gets boosted up to gamma n zero. So in this frame, the energy density is larger than the rest energy. Uh, excuse me, than the rest energy density, with a gamma squared factor. Straightforward algebra, but I want you to stop and think about what that's telling us. If this rho were a component of a 4 vector, is there any way I could get a gamma squared out of this thing by bopping between reference frames? No, right? When I do that, it's linear in the Lorentz transformation matrix. There's no way with a linear transformation that I would pick up two powers of gamma. This is not how a you guys are probably all used to from Newtonian physics of thinking of energy density as a scalar. This is not a Lorentz scalar. Okay? A scalar is the same in all frames of reference. So this is a different quantity. So it's neither a four vector component nor a scalar. 
Okay, it's got two of those things, so it's not going to surprise you that what's actually going on here is we are picking out, what we've done here is we've picked out a particular component of a tensor. But let's think a little bit more methodically about what tensor that must be. So when I originally wrote down my row zero here, I sort of just argued on physical grounds uh, that it is, you know, it's the energy of every particle times the number of particles per unit volume of that thing. Well, the energy that I use in this thing, doing it in both the rest frame and in the other frame, those are the time-like components of a particular four vector. Okay. So we assembled rho by combining <coughs> energy, which is the time-like component of the four momentum. with number density, which is the time-like component of the number vector that I just recapped a few minutes ago. <clears throat> so those are two time-like components of four vectors here. So that row is something like, well, let's put it this way. I can write this as PT NT, which tells me that it belongs to a tensor. So let's define this as some TT of a tensor that I've not carefully introduced yet. There is some underlying tensor that we have built by looking at the, you know, you can, so there's various names for this. We'll call it the tensor product of two different four vectors. So if I write this in the kind of abstract tensor notation that I've used occasionally in uh, some of your textbooks, this will be written with a boldface capital T. I will use a double overline for this. We might say that this T is the tensor product of the number vector with the four momentum. Okay? Now the number vector is itself just n0 times the four velocity. And my momentum, since all the particles I'm assuming are the same, is just the rest mass times the four momentum. <clears throat> this thing actually looks kind of like the four velocity times the four velocity with a prefactor. And that prefactor is nothing more than the rest density. OK, so another way to say this is that if I make my cloud of dust, and I go in and I look at its, uh, every little element in it. I take the rest energy density of every dense, every element in that dust. I construct the tensor that comes from making the tensor product of the four velocity of that dust with itself. That is what this geometric object is equal to. If you want to write this in index notation, which is how we will write it 99.8% of the time, We would say that component alpha beta of this quantity t <coughs> is that rest density times u alpha u beta. So this is, in terms of the physics we're going to do this term, this is perhaps the most important quantity that we're going to talk about. So it's worth understanding what this thing is really telling us. So. <coughs> If I want to get these components, the alpha beta, out of this thing from this sort of abstract notation of the tensor, so I'll remind you that we can do this by taking the tensor and plugging into its slots, the basis one forms, 
which tell me something about basis one forms are really useful for sort of measuring fluxes across a in a particular direction. And in fact, this quantity has the geometric interpretation. Think of this as the flux of momentum component alpha in the beta direction. <clears throat> OK, so if we look at this component by component, it's worth doing that. So let's do the TT or 0, 0 component. OK, so this is the one we've already done. This is just rho 0, ut, ut, which is rho in that thing. According to the words I've written down here, this is the flux of PT in the T direction. <clears throat> okay, so PT tells me about energy. The flux of energy in the energy direction refers to, you know, so here's my water flowing in the time like direction, just sitting there apparently doing nothing, but no, it's moving through time. This is energy. Uh, flowing through time, it's energy density. All sort of locked up in <coughs> stable equilibrium here. But if somebody comes in someday with a nice cup of anti-water and combines it, we get to have all that energy released, and we can enjoy that for a few femtoseconds before we evaporate. <laughs> Let's look at the other components. <coughs> So T0i, okay, you can take the definition and plug it in in terms of the components. It's obviously ut times ui, but still use the definition by words. So this is the flux of p sub t in the xi direction. OK, so this is talking about ec uh, energy moving in a particular direction. This is nothing more than energy flux. OK, energy sort of flux that we are used to thinking about, not flowing through time, but throwing through space. Now, T0i, <clears throat> this is the flux of momentum component i. in the t direction. <clears throat> so this tells me about momentum density. Okay, so if I have this stuff flowing, okay, there's some momentum associated with that flow. You can count up the amount of mo mass in every little volume, divide by that volume, take some ratios. That is the density of momentum. And finally, this last one, flux of pi in the xj direction. There's really no great wisdom for that. This is nothing more than momentum flux. If I have uh, a bucket of water and things are sort of sloshing around, there's some momentum moving, and the whole assembly is moving in some direction, we can get a flow of momentum going in kind of a non-normal direction. Sometimes it goes in a normal direction. It might be moving along with its flow. I'm going to talk about that in a few moments when I talk about a few different kinds of uh, uh, stress energy tensors. Um, the key thing which I want you to be aware of is that under the hood of this thing, we're going to talk about different kinds of stress energy tensors for uh, a little later in this class. But this basic interpretation of the way to think about the different components, it holds for all of them. Okay, So this is good intuition to have. <laughs> Um, one thing which is worth noting is, you know, if you look at, if you actually, let's, let's take the form of the stress energy tensor that corresponds to the dust. 
OK, so I'm going to write out all four of my complements. I've already given you t0, 0. t0i, I can write that as gamma squared rho 0 vi. t0i equals gamma squared rho 0 vi. And this guy is gamma squared rho 0 vi vj. There's two elements of symmetry here, which I want to emphasize. Notice energy density and momentum flux. Sorry. Energy flux and momentum density. <laughs> Those words are important. Energy flux and momentum density, they're exactly the same. Okay? That is actually true in all physics. Okay? It's clouded by the fact, though, that in most units that we measure things in, we don't typically use speed of light equal to 1. So when you look at these kind of quantities in the physics that you are more used to, uh, you would find you know, your, energy, uh, your energy flux and your momentum density will have different units, OK? Because you'll have factors of C that come into there that convert from one you know, momentum and energy and time flow and space flow. Uh, also, you don't usually include rest mass and rest energy in the uh, energy flows and momentum densities that you've probably been familiar with in the past. Okay? So it's when we do relativity and we set the speed of light equal to 1 that this symmetry between energy flux and momentum density becomes apparent. Question? Sorry, this one? Yeah. On the right hand side. On the right hand side. This is. No, this is, this is definitely what I mean to write down here. So this is what I've done. I've taken advantage of the fact that I can write, uh, let's see, do I have it down somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, so what I've done over here is I have written the fact, so u sub t, u t, is it's just the gamma factor, OK? Um, and I didn't explicitly write out what t, the, you know, the, the i complex, but you get a similar factor there with that. So no, that, that is correct that way. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just want to emphasize, I mean, the key thing which I want to emphasize is when you do it in the physics that you guys have generally all seen up till now, it won't look that way. And that's two causes of that. One is you're not used to necessarily working in units where the speed of light is one. And two, rest energy is built into these definitions. That shifts things a little bit. The other thing which I want to emphasize is notice this is symmetric under exchange of indices. Okay? Now, it's obvious for dust. It comes right back to the fact that these guys, uh, that those indices enter like so. It's an it's exterior product of the four velocity with itself. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through in detail, but there's a physical motivation that I will sketch in a few moments that argues that it must be symmetric like this in all physical cases. Okay? I have detailed, uh, a, a detailed sketch of this. It's, it's, I keep using the word sketch because my mind wants to say proof, but it ain't a proof. Okay? <laughs> it's sort of a motivation. Um, uh, and so I, I will post it for everyone to go through, but I will sort of uh, illuminate it in a couple moments. Basically, if this is not true, if it's not the case, this is symmetric, a physical absurdity can, can be set up. I'll describe that in a few moments. So most of the world is not dust. Uh, so this is a decent example for helping to understand things. Uh, but we are going to want to do more complicated and interesting examples. Pardon me just one second. Let me just check over this page. Yeah. So. <clears throat> For us, the way that we are going to do this, there is a, a, a fairly general recipe that one can imagine applying to this. I'm going to save it for a little later in the class. It sort of borrows some techniques from field theory. Uh, basically, if you can write down a Lagrangian density that describes the system that you're under, uh, under study, there's a particular, particular variation you can do that the stress energy tensor emerges from. But for now, the key thing which I want to sort of say is that we basically are going to deduce what the stress energy tensor looks like. 
by essentially going into a particular frame, we'll call it the rest frame, it's usually the rest frame of some element of the material being uh, studied, and thinking carefully about this physical definition of what the different components mean. Okay? This is not the most rigorous way to do it, uh, but it's a good way to get started and to develop some intuition. OK, so let me give one example that for many of us in astrophysics, this is probably the one stress energy tensor that we write down and use over and over and over again in our career. And it's rare we do anything more than this uh, in many, many cases. This is called a perfect fluid. So what is perfect about a perfect fluid? That's, you know, it begs the question here. What, 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 is, what is perfect referring to here? So a perfect fluid is a fluid in which there is no energy flow in what I will call the rest frame. I put rest in quotes because you have to sort of define it from the context of, of what your fluid is here. Basically what it means is I can find a frame in which each fluid element, there is no energy flow there. If a frame exists where that happens, this is a candidate to be a perfect fluid. And I also require there to be no lateral stresses. Lateral stresses refer to this Tij when i and j are not equal to one another. Okay? So this sort of refers to, imagine that i have some, let's say that going into the board is the y direction. So if there's like some y stress that is somehow being transported in the x direction, that would be a lateral stress. Physically, this is actually, that kind of a stress is hugely important when one is studying fluids. Okay? And one characterizes it by a quantity known as the viscosity. Okay, viscosity tells me about how stress gets transported, or how momentum rather gets transported in a non uh, a non normal direction against the direction in which the fluid is moving. So my perfect fluid has no viscosity, and I'll just conclude because I want to make a there's a very important point here. A fluid that has no viscosity is a fluid that doesn't get anything wet. Okay, so this refers to when you pour water on yourself, the reason your hand gets wet is that there's some viscosity that actually prevents, it causes there to be sort of a, a shearing force which causes the water to stick to your skin. So a perfect fluid, this has been described as the physics of dry water. <laughs> okay, so it is, uh, anyone who's in applied math will know, they'll sort of roll their eyes and say, okay, fine, we'll do this sort of infant version of, uh, of fluid first. Um, and then a lot of the action and a lot of the fun comes from putting in viscosity and doing the real fluids. For the purposes of our class, what this boils down to is this tells me that the physics of this quantity is totally dominated by the fluid's energy density and its pressure. The pressure is an isotropic spatial stress. <clears throat> so in this particular frame where I have no energy being transported, And the stress energy tensor can be represented as energy density, as usual, up in the, whoops, over there now, up in the TT component. There is no energy flux. By symmetry, if there's no energy flux, there is no momentum density. 
and my spatial stresses are totally isotropic, and none of them are lateral. So it just looks like this. The diagonal of rho p, p, p. <clears throat> okay, as I said, this is actually something that we're going to use over and over and over again. This is actually a, and so you can actually consider my dust stress energy tensor to be a perfect fluid with no pressure. Okay, so this actually subsumes this, this other one. Uh, I will, just for illustrative purposes, I'll show an example of a case that cannot be thought of as a, uh, as a perfect fluid, but we will tend to use this a lot in our class. And as I will demonstrate in just a moment, we're going to find that this ends up playing an important role in generating gravitational fields. And what's interesting about this is you guys are probably used to the idea that mass generates gravity, and then throw in a C squared that tells you energy is generating gravity. But it's also, we're going to see pressure generates gravity. Okay? And it's connected to the mathematical structure of uh, this guy here. So notice I've written an equal dot here. OK, so this is just the way this is represented in this particular frame. I would like to write this in a more covariant form, something that does not rely on me going into a particular frame of reference. So the trick which I'm going to use for this is that I think about that form there. So the row piece of it, clearly what I'm doing there is I'm picking out, you know, that is, can be thought of as the energy density multiplied by the tensor product of the four velocity that describes a particular element of this fluid. So I can write again using this sort of abstract notation, this piece of it looks like this. Okay? And so if I go into the frame, if I go into the rest frame of the fluid, that's just, you know, my u is 1 and 0 is in the spatial components. That builds my upper left-hand corner of this tensor. How do I get the rest of this? Well, to get the rest of it, these are all sort of picked out of components of the tensor that are orthogonal to u. And I put an Easter egg in P set 1. Okay, you guys developed a tensor that allows me to build, it's a geometric object that allows me to describe things that are orthogonal to a given 4 vector. So if I take the projection tensor that you guys built on P set 1, looks like the metric plus the, extern the, uh, out the tensor product of a four vector with itself, that gives me the p's that go into that component. Okay? Or if I write this in index notation, I can do it in two ways. I will also emphasize that there are a few moments in this class where I sort of urge you to take the sort of long-term memory synapses and switch them on. This is one of those moments. In a couple of lectures, we're going to introduce the principle of equivalence, which is the physical principle by which we're going to argue how we go from formulas that work in special relativity to formulas that work in general relativity. And by invoking the principle of equivalence, we're going to see that when we want to describe perfect fluids in a general space time, not just in special relativity and general, in general relativity, it's exactly this formula. I just need to modify what the metric means. Okay? But that will allow me to carry that over. Uh, let me see. So my notes are a little bit disorganized here because this is a piece that I. Every year I want to clean this bit up, and every year at this time of year I have 70 gajillion administrative tasks, and I end up getting behind schedule. So I will clean this up on the fly. So there's a couple points which I want to make about this. Let me do this point first. <clears throat> 
So by virtue of taking a graduate physics class, I'm confident you guys know about Newtonian gravity. One can write the field equation for Newtonian gravity. as essentially a differential equation for the potential that governs the Newtonian gravitational interaction. So let's call phi sub g the Newtonian gravitational interaction. Oops. And I can write a field equation that's governing it as uh, essentially it's Poisson's equation. Okay? So the Laplace operator acting on that potential is up to a constant equal to the we, we usually learn it in terms of mass density. Uh, we're working in units where the speed of light is equal to 1, so it could just as well be the energy density. Um, so you've all kind of seen that. Now, if we think about how we're going to carry this forward and make gravity a relativistic interaction, this equation should right away make us suspicious. Because we spent several minutes earlier today talking about the fact that this is not a scalar. Okay? This is the component of a tensor. Okay, a physical theory which tries to pick out just one component of a geometric tensor is not a healthy theory. Okay? It would be like if you had sort of learned in e &M that you know, there was a preferred direction to the electric field. You know, if there's a particular set of Maxwell's equations for EX and a different set of Maxwell's equations for EY, that would just be nonsense. Okay? Nature doesn't pick out spatial components of anyone as being particularly uh, uh, having some weight over the others. And the same thing holds in relativity for space-time. So when we make this into a relativistic theory, we're going to say, ah, if this component of a tensor plays a large role in gravity, to make this into a geometric object that makes a large role in gravity, I'm going to have to, so let's call this my Newtonian equation, my Einsteinian equation, I'm going to put an equal sign in quotes here because there's a lot of details to fill in. But what's going to go on the right-hand side of this has to be something that involves the stress-energy tensor. Okay? Newton picks out one component of the stress-energy tensor. Relativity doesn't let me pick out particular components. So whatever I get when I do Einstein's gravity, the whole stress-energy tensor is going to be important in setting the source of my gravity. That then sort of says, well, then what the heck do you do with this left-hand side? That is, in fact, going to be starting probably on Tuesday, the subject of the next uh, couple of lectures, basically going all the way up to spring break. Okay? The week before spring break is when we complete the story of what goes on the right-hand side, excuse me, the left-hand side of this equation. But what I will tell you is that it is indeed going to involve two derivatives of a potential-like object. And the potential-like object is actually going to turn out to be the metric of space-time. Okay? So that's kind of where we're going with this. All right. So let's do a little bit more physics with the stress energy tensor. So I'm, I have somewhat more detailed notes, uh, which I will post online, which I am not going to go through in great detail here, but I'm going to kind of sketch this. So one is that I would like to prove, again, that word is a little bit of an overstatement, but at least motivate the symmetry of this tensor. OK, I'm just going to focus on the spatial bits of this. That'll be enough. Okay? Uh, like I said, you can kind of see that T0i and Ti0 are the same thing by thinking about the physical meaning of form momentum and what a flux of form momentum is. This one, there's uh, kind of a, a, a cute calculation you can do. 
So imagine you have some little cube of stuff. Could be immersed in some field or fluid, something that is described by a field of stress energy. And so to start out with, let's look at how the flux of, remember what, what T alpha beta, or really Tij tells me about, is the flux of momentum in a particular direction. It's telling me about the amount of momentum going into this box on one side and coming out on the other. Okay? So I'm going to look at the momentum flux into and out of this box. And so what I'm going to do is let's look at the momentum going into the sides that are, um, so let's call this the top and the bottom here. What I'm going to do then is number the four sides, the other four sides of the box, not the top and the bottom. So let's call this side, which is sort of facing away from us here, that side one, the one that is facing us, that sort of points out in the x direction. I'll call that two. This side here, I will call three. And the one that is on the back, I will call four. Apologies for the little bit of a, a busy picture here. But just what you want to do is sort of imagine you have this cube in front of you, and you go around and label the four sides. like to do is calculate what is the force that is flowing through each of these four sides. Okay, one, two, three, and four. Let's ignore the top and the bottom for just a second. I'll describe why that is in just a moment. So if I look at the force on phase one, okay, well, phase one, it is, um, pardon me, I mislabeled my sides. <clears throat> I want to be synced up with my notes. And so I realize this is annoying, and I'm very sorry about that. But if I mess this up, I will get out of sync with what I have written down. So the one that is facing us is side one. Two is on the right-hand side. Three is the back. Four is on the left-hand side. My apologies for that, but I think it's important we get that right so I don't get out of sync with myself. So the total force on phase one is what I get by basically adding up all the flux of momentum flowing through phase one. So force on phase one, that is the ith component of that, is what I get when I integrate that over phase one, which is normal to the x-axis, each side of the cube is little l, so it's tix l squared. Okay. Force on phase two. Okay. Now this is the one that is normal to the y-axis. And so this guy looks like Tiy L squared. OK? And as you continue this, F3, you look at that. And you know if you assume that this thing is small, it's approximately the same as the force on F1. It'll become equal in the limit of the cube becoming infinitesimally small. <clears throat> 
and this is approximately the same as the force on phase two. So that tells us that there's no unbalanced force on this thing, which is great. Um, Basically, it means that you know, there's no unbalanced force causing this little element to accelerate away. One of the reasons why I am focusing on these four sides, though, is I would also like to consider torques that are acting on this thing. Here's where I'm going to skip over a couple of details and just leave a few notes for you guys to look at because we're a little short on time and there's other things. This calculation is straightforward, but it gets, <laughs> I already screwed up a detail here. I don't want to sort of uh, risk messing up a few other things. What I want to do is consider the torques about an axis that sort of runs through the middle of this thing that goes from the top and the bottom of this. Okay, so go through and just add up all the torques associated with these little forces about an axis in the center of. Uh, that goes through the center of this cube. So I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to leave out the details, but basically you go through and you do the usual R cross F to get the forces, the torques associated with each of these different faces. And what you'll find when you do this is that there is a net torque that looks like L cubed times Txy minus Tyx. Again, though, this scales with the size of the cube, right? So you look at this and kind of go, well, who cares? You know, it's a little bit there. Maybe it, it spins up a little bit. But in the limit of this thing going to 0, there's no net effect. Well, let's be a little bit careful about this. What is the moment of inertia of this cube? I don't know uh, exactly, but I know that it's going to be something like the mass of this cube. We'll call that L cubed times its mass density, or its energy density. Um, and it's going to involve two powers of the only length scale characterizing this thing. And there'll be some prefactor alpha. There'll be some number that's related to the geometry of this. Okay. An integral or two will easily work out what the alpha is and make this more precise. But the key bit, which I want to emphasize, is that this is something that scales as the size of the fifth power. <clears throat> so yeah, the torque vanishes as L goes to 0, but it does so with the cubed power it doesn't vanish as quickly as the moment of inertia vanishes. And I'll remind you, the angular acceleration of the cube theta double dot is the torque divided by the moment of inertia. So this is something that is proportional to Txy minus Tyx divided by L squared. So yeah, the torque does vanish as L goes to 0, but the moment of inertia vanishes more rapidly as L goes to 0. And that sort of suggests that if we're in a screwy universe, little microscopic vortices are just going to start randomly oscillating in any cup of water that you pour in front of you. <laughs> 
Now, I don't have a proof that nature abhors that, but it seems pretty screwy. And so the case that most textbooks make at this point is to say physics indicates we must have txy strikingly equal to tyx in all cases, independent of what the size of this thing is. Okay, that had better just be a bloody zero in the numerator uh, in order to prevent this physical absurdity from being set up. Uh, repeat the exercise by looking at torques around the other axes, and that drives you to the statement that this thing must, in general, be spatially symmetric. And again, physics of the way that energy and momentum behave in relativity makes our sort of time space component symmetric as well. I emphasize this is not a proof. This is really just a physical motivation. This is the kind of thing that uh, I'm a bloody astrophysicist. I like this kind of stuff. Uh, there is a different way of developing the stress energy tensor, as I said, that comes from a variational principle, sort of based on uh, sort of quantum field, field theoretic type of methods. And the symmetry in that case is manifest. Okay? It really does sort of come up. Uh, but this is a good way of just motivating the fact that you're not going to have any non-diagonal, or excuse me, non-symmetric uh, stress energy tensors. Okay? If you did, you would have really bizarre matter. All right. Now, the stress energy tensor has this physical interpretation that it tells me about the flow of energy and the flow of momentum in spacetime. As such, it is the tool by which we are going to put conservation of energy and conservation of momentum into our theory. And the way we're going to do this is with a remarkably simple equation. The space-time divergence of t alpha beta must equal 0. This is a covariant formulation of both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And if you want to say, well, which one? Is it energy or is it momentum? You can't say that in general. Okay? I can only say that after I have picked a particular reference frame, because it's only once I have defined time and I've defined space that I've actually defined energy and momentum. Prior to choosing a particular reference frame, all I have is four momentum. One observer's energy is another observer's superposition of energy and momentum. Once I have picked a particular frame, so once I have picked a particular frame, Then if I evaluate d alpha of t alpha either 0 or t, this is what conservation of energy looks like in that frame. In that frame, here is conservation of energy. And I can fit it. No, 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 no. I had it right the first time. 
sorry, just trying to make sure I got my indices lined up properly. <clears throat> so apologies, you can't quite read the bottom one so well. Top one is conservation of energy in that particular frame. Second one is conservation of momentum in that particular frame. Okay, and again, the, the key thing which I wanted to emphasize is the covariant statement basically puts both of them together into a single equation. I can only sensibly state conservation of energy and conservation of momentum according to some particular observer. Now, I can repeat the game that I had done before uh, with the number vector and turn these conservation laws into integral equations as well. Let me do it for energy. So if I take uh, that, that integral equation, integrate over a three volume, or if you prefer, I can take the, the original covariant formulation, integrate that over a four volume, um, with a little bit of manipulation akin to the way I manipulated the, the, the integrals associated with the number vector in the previous lecture, you can write down a law that looks like this. Okay, and so this, again, what I've done here is I've chosen a particular set of time-like coordinates. And the language that we often use in relativity is we basically say, I'm going to take a single slice of time. And I would say that the rate of change of energy, so integrate energy over a volume is the total energy in that V3. The rate of change of that thing is balanced by the amount of energy flowing into or out of through the boundaries of that volume. Okay. Add an extra index here, so make this, this uh, make one of these be a J, make this guy be a J, and you've got a similar statement for the conservation of momentum. Okay. This is a particular trick. I have a uh, um, set of typed up notes that just sort of clean this up a little bit, and they're basically exactly this point, but I'll, I'll put them online after today's lecture. You're going to want to use this on one of the PSET problems this week. Okay, so you guys are going to do a couple exercises that involves integrating and actually finding essentially moments of uh, the left-hand side of this thing. Okay, you're going to do a few exercises where you take advantage of this, con this formulation of conservation of energy and momentum uh, to derive a few uh, identities involving the stress energy tensor, one of which is another Easter egg that we're going to use quite a bit um, in a future lecture. All right. So let me just wrap up our discussion of the stress energy tensor by just doing two more examples, and then I'm going to sort of begin switching gears a little bit. So, so far, I have uh, only described, essentially, I've really only described perfect fluids. Okay? Dust is a perfect fluid with no pressure. <clears throat> there are a lot of other kinds of materials that we want to work with in the universe. One of them which, it's unlikely many of you are going to use this, but it's actually the stress energy tensor on which I have built, well, I guess Alex is going to use it a little bit, I have built a, a big chunk of my career, is suppose you have you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, uh, how the, the four velocity and the four momentum are really only good for talking about like the kinematics of particles. <clears throat> well, actually, particles aren't a bad thing to focus on in some of your studies. Okay, and much of my research is actually based on the idea of thinking about a binary system as being one member being a black hole and its companion being a particle-like object that's it's a particular limit of it, a particle-like object that orbits it. So, a really simple stress energy tensor. And I'm just throwing it out here because I think it nicely illustrates the principle. A point particle with rest mass, we'll call it M0, and I'm going to say it's moving on a particular world line through space-time. 
So the way we define a world line is we just say it's some four vector that describes the displacement of this thing from some chosen origin. And it's generally most convenient to parameterize it by the proper time of whatever object or creature is moving on that world line. And so it's a lot like dust, only there's no volume, right? It's sort of like one particle of dust. And so the stress energy tensor we use for this Let me back up for just a second here. When you guys learned about uh, electricity and magnetism, okay, one of the first things you learn about are point charges. And then a little bit later you learn about charge distributions and you have charge densities. Okay? And then usually at some point in a class that's often like junior level e &M, we say, how do you describe the density of a point charge? And that's where you learn about the Dirac delta function. Well, if I have a point particle, I'm going to need to describe this thing's energy density as essentially a Dirac delta function. And so what we do is imagining that these things, so this is the four velocity of that body, they might be functions of time as this guy is moving along here. What we do is we introduce a Dirac delta function as this thing moves along through space time. And what this does, you can check the dimensions. This gives me exactly what we need in order to have something that's dimensionally correct and has all the symmetries and all the properties that describe a particle moving with a particular four velocity through space time. Now, <clears throat> you might want to just, it's the thing which I kind of want to pause on for a second. You go, what the hell do you do with this, right? That's kind of inconvenient. Well, the trick we use to sort of clean up that Dirac delta function is It's very much like what you do when you encounter multidimensional delta functions in basic physics. You just build it out of a bunch of one-dimensional delta functions. Okay. Likewise, you'll have a term with the y component and the z component. And then you use the rule. that if I integrate a function of x against a delta function whose argument is itself a function of x, I evaluate that function at the zeros of g so let's say x0 is where g has a 0 normalizing to the first derivative of g evaluated at that 0. <laughs> so when you put all of that together, it basically means you can do this somewhat uh, abstract integral formally. I mean, exactly. You can just do it analytically. And what you do is you, just, you choose one of the delta functions to apply it to. Traditionally, people apply it to the time-like component. And what is the derivative of the world line z component with respect to proper time? It's the zero component of the four velocity. So you just divide by the zero component of the four velocity. And then you're left with a three-dimensional delta function for the spatial trajectory of this thing through all of space. So this is an example of one that uh, just, again, kind of the intuition is one of the things I want to emphasize. Notice we have this has the symmetries that we want it to have. It's not hard to show that this, you can think of this as essentially being kind of like a gamma factor. This all ends up giving me just what we need for this thing to have the right transformation properties. Um, and so, and it does in fact play a role in uh, some, well, I'll just say in some research that's near and dear to my heart. Let me do another example. Suppose you want to know the stress energy tensor 
associated with a given electric and magnetic field. Well, first, let me just quote for you the exact answer, which is most compactly written if we use that Faraday tensor F, which describes electric magnetic fields in uh, a frame independent fashion, the way that I introduced it in the last lecture. So in units where basically everything but pi is set equal to 1, it ends up turning into this. Okay, so that's a bit of a mouthful. Let's go in and look at particular components of it, though. Okay, so let's say I go into a particular frame. I fill in my Faraday tensor with the form of the electric magnetic field that I introduced last time. And I'll just go through and I'll evaluate all the different components of this thing. So what you find when you fill this in is your T00 component. One over eight pi e squared plus b squared. Okay, that's good. Okay, hopefully you all remember from basic E and M, the energy density of an E field is e squared over eight pi in the right system of units. Energy density of a b field is b squared over eight pi if you work in God's units. Let's do the time space component. So again, hack through that mess there. This is going to be something that is a vector. In fact, it's the pointing vector. Okay? Could it be anything else? If you use the recipe that I sort of suggested as the, you know, the easiest way to approach this, this is kind of what you would have guessed for something like that. The bit that's actually kind of hard is then trying to get the spatial stresses of this thing. And here, I don't have any great intuition for this one to convey to you. Uh, it's derived in textbooks like Griffiths and Jackson. So I'll just quote for you the result. So you get one term that looks like e squared plus b squared on the diagonals. But then there's a correction. Which looks like this. I want to just quickly call out one example so you can see what the, the significance of this example is. So suppose you have something like pair of capacitors, right? And there's just a uniform electric field between them. You want to evaluate the stress energy tensor between those pairs of capacitors. So my spatial electric field, let's say it just points in the x direction, and it's constant. So when you actually evaluate this guy, there's no energy flow. There's no magnetic field, so there's no pointing vector. You, of course, have e squared over 8 pi for your energy density. Okay, very different from a perfect fluid. Okay, and this kind of makes sense. That's sort of telling you that there is a stress that, you know, if you have a pair of plane parallel capacitors, <laughs> you tend to attract the plates to each other, right? Uh, but there's a pressure associated with that electric field that actually goes in the other directions. Okay, this is your x direction, this is y and z. Um, and as a consequence of this, so there's some stuff which we're not going to do too much with in this class, but I may give you some pointers on this. Electric and magnetic fields generate, they generate pressures, at least in certain directions, they kind of generate like an anisotropic pressure. 
Uh, and when we start coupling this to gravity, you can get electric fields and magnetic fields that contribute non-negligibly to the gravity of their object. That is it for the stress energy tensor. As I said, we are going to use this guy over and over and over again. And the reason for this does come back to that little motivation that I gave uh, probably about 45 minutes ago, um, where we sort of looked at the Newtonian field equation and then said, picking out a particular scalar as the source of gravity makes no sense in a relativistic covariant theory. It's got to be the whole tensor. And uh, indeed, this is the one, well, not necessarily the E&M one, but the general notion of a stress energy tensor is the one that we are going to use for that. So we have about 10 minutes left. And so I would like to start the process of switching gears. Before I do that, are there any questions? All right, I will clean the board. So the reason we are switching gears is we now have probably the most important physical tools that we need in order to start thinking about making a relativistic theory of gravity. Um, but we need a few more mathematical tools. In particular, I'm going to argue uh, in a couple of lectures that flat spacetime is not sufficient for us to build a theory of gravity. We're going to need to, first of all, you're going to have to understand what that means, and we're not quite ready to go there. So for now, it's just fancy words. Uh, but I'm going to have to introduce some kind of a notion of curvature into things. Okay, what does that even mean, really? We need to have the tools to do that. And so as a prelude to going in that direction, I will call this my prelude to curvature. What we're going to start doing is Flat space time in curvilinear coordinates. <clears throat> and the importance of doing this, why this is going to be useful to us, is that it will introduce a, so it'll keep the physics simple. It's still going to be special relativity, but it's now going to be special relativity using uh, a mathematical structure in which the basis vectors are no longer constant. Okay? So that's going to allow us to begin making a couple of the mathematical tools that are necessary to build gravity into this theory. So we'll start by replacing this with just simple plane polar coordinates. Okay? mapped in the usual way. So if you want to go back and forth, well, at least one way transformation. I build x and y from r and phi in that usual way. There's an inverse mapping as well, which involves trig functions, so I'm not going to write it down. One point which I really want to emphasize here is we are going to continue to use a coordinate basis. remind you what that means. So a coordinate basis means that the differential displacement vector from an event A to a nearby event B is simply related by differentials of my coordinate contracted onto my basis vectors. But when I'm working in a curvilinear coordinate system like this, that means one of them has a somewhat different form from what you are used to. Okay? When you guys talk about the differential of a displacement in just about every physics class up till now, if you have a differential angle, you'd want to throw an r into here so that this has the dimensions of length. 
We ain't going to do that. Okay? And so what this means, since this is an angle, every component of this has the dimensions of length. That means that my basis vector is going to be something that has the dimensions of length associated with it. Okay? This, in turn, means that this is not going to be a normal basis. Okay. That's unfortunately a somewhat loaded word. What I mean by that is that it has not been normalized. But given that you guys have spent all of your career thinking about the dot product of a unit vector with itself, of a basis vector with itself being equal to 1, the other meaning of normal might be good for you too. The key thing which I want to emphasize here is e phi dot e phi does not equal 1. One other little bit of notation which I would like to introduce. So we are going to want to talk about transformations between different representations. Okay? We've done this so far. We have generally focused on moving between different reference frames. I want to generalize this notion. And I'm going to tweak my notation a little bit to indicate the difference. Okay? So I'm going to call capital L alpha mu bar be what I get when I just look at the variation of coordinate, the alpha coordinate system, sorry, the unbarred coordinate system with the barred one. Okay? So this is just, it's, it's, there, there's, there's no deep things here. I just want you to be familiar with the notation which I'm going to use. I will always reserve lambda for the Lorentz transformation. Okay. So in the interest of time, you know, I'll just I'll write down one of these. So this sort of means, like, for instance, suppose that I'm transforming. Let's let Bard indicate my polar coordinates. Unbard be Cartesian. So if I want to transform in one direction between my barred and my unbarred ones, this matrix will go through it, and it looks like this. This is the thing which I will call L alpha mu bar. Okay. In my notes, I also give the inverse transmission. And I will actually write, you know what? I have a minute. I will write that one down as well. If you want to know how to go in the other direction, it's just the matrix that inverts this. The reason I decided to take the extra 30 seconds or so to write this down is I want to call out the fact that in this kind of a transformation, because of the fact that this is a coordinate basis that has this somewhat unusual property, different elements of the matrix have different dimensions. Okay? It's a feature, not a bug. Okay? So this is going to show up 
Um, I'm going to do a couple more calculations with this uh, a little bit uh, tomorrow. Sorry, not tomorrow, on, on Tuesday. Uh, this is going to show up in the way the metric looks. Okay, the metric is going to have a very different character in this coordinate system. And we're going to see the way in which it basically boils down to is it's going to pick up a non-trivial functional form. It's not going to just be a constant. And that fundamentally reflects the fact that the basis vectors are not constant anymore. Okay? We'll end it there.